Ladies and uh, gentlemen, Professor Hall, uh, distinguished guests, I'm very happy to be with you here um, today. We have come together here in Graz, in the heart of Europe, I would say in a small country which is uh, snuggled into the heart of Europe, which is uh, Steiermark, uh, Syria, and which is Austria. We are not uh, a big country, but we are proud of the fact that we do a lot in innovation. And we're number two in Europe only, after Sweden, uh, concerning R&D. So R&D, we are number two, and a lot of uh, people do not know this, and so therefore uh, we are especially proud about that. And we are also very proud that uh, Josef Schumpeter himself was Austrian, definitely, and that we have the opportunity also to have a distinguished guest, Professor Hall, here today, who will talk uh, to us about innovation, the future, and uh, the research she's doing, and the, she's doing, and the experience she has been uh, taking over the years. The motto of the assembly is connect share and innovate. And definitely this is what we have to do. We need to connect, we need to connect universities and research institutions with uh, the employees uh, of companies, with companies, with large companies, uh, with small companies, SME, and also with, uh, with the startups. Especially uh, the SME companies, not uh, which are not startups, um, they are. Uh, I'm very. I feel very responsible for those because uh, they uh, form the majority of our economy. In Austria, it's definitely 99.8 percent. So only 0.2 percent of Austrian companies have more than 250 employees. So we have an economy here which is based on the SME. And I was just coming back from Asia. I was in South Korea, in Korea, and they have a completely different economy, which is mainly based on large, very large companies. And they are highly interested in sharing with us our knowledge and experience uh, in this type of businesses. We are proud of our entrepreneurs and uh, we are also proud, and I'm personally also very proud, that 50% of the Austrian entrepreneurs starting a business are female. This has not been the case uh, only a few years ago. So a lot of things are changing. We need innovation, we need these entrepreneurial spirits, and we need uh, the startups. And we need to show together in Europe that SME is strong, and it's not only about the platform economies, that SMEs can be smart, that they can be successful, that they can be innovation leader worldwide. And in Austria, we have around 150 to 200 innovation leaders, which is very important for all of us. With our strategy on the European level, uh, we have put it to a motto which is called Europe that protects. And as I have indicated uh, the evening before, maybe some of you have shared us uh, before, a Europe that protects does not only mean that we are protecting the borders so that we can keep the freedom inside Europe, um, the freedom of people, the freedom of movements of goods, and so on, but that we are protecting innovation and that we are doing the best that companies can stay in Europe and prosper in Europe. And I speak from experience because I was 22 years in IT and telecom industry and unfortunately some of them I have seen leaving. Some have just disappeared. Big technical companies which I have been working for, they just disappeared and were not there anymore. So we commonly do have a responsibility as influencers, as decision makers in business, as decision makers in politics, both on Austrian and on country and on European level, that we make it possible for European companies to flourish and to grow and to be successful. Because Europe is a beautiful place to live, it's a beautiful place to share, and it's our responsibility to protect it and to take care that it's prospering both in wealth 
and uh, also in jobs. So I'm very happy and thankful that, uh, Professor, you are here today with us and you are sharing uh, with us your experience. Thank you that you're joining us and I'm uh, hoping that you also will have a very interesting evening today and, uh, and also a very interesting day tomorrow. Thank you very much. I would like to join Minister Chambuk in her thanks to you, Professor Hall, for accepting our invitation. I'm here to present you. Fronrid Hall is Professor of Economics Emerita at the University of California at Berkeley and visiting professor at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. She's a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London and a visiting fellow at the National Institute of Economics and Social Research in London. She was Professor of Economics of Technology and Innovation at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands from 2005 to 2015. She has received a, a BA in Physics from Wellesley College and a PhD in Economics from Stanford University. Professor Hall has published articles on the economics and econometrics of technical change and innovation in journals such as Econometrica, the American Economic Review, the Rand Journal of Economics, and research policy. Professor Hall, you are the third Schumpeter lecturer after Professor Agion and Professor Fagerberg, and we look forward to your thoughts. In a city, in particular, where Schumpeter has taught, uh, we couldn't be in a better place, so the floor is yours. Many thanks for being here. Well, I'm extremely grateful and honored to be invited to speak in the you know, home city of uh, Professor Schumpeter. Um, and I have to say, I enjoyed very much getting to know Graz a little bit today, uh, so, because it was my first time here. So I thank um, all of the people that invited me. I'm afraid I <laughs> can't do it by name because there were so many of them that I talked to over, over time. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about a one topic, a, a relatively, we might say, a narrow topic compared to the interests of the SME assembly, um, which is tax policy for innovation. But uh, it's you know relevant for SMEs as it is for large firms, uh, and it's certainly something that policymakers in Europe uh, have spent a lot of time on, uh, continue to spend time on, uh, and um, and also in my country. And uh, I just gave this talk at the OECD where there was a lot of interest uh, in it. So that, um, that uh, shows you <laughs> that um, it's around the world. Now, um, and in fact, I'm going to Brazil to talk about the same topic. So it uh, gives you an idea. The BRICS are interested too. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the slides, so I don't know quite what, which one we're on. But so I have to keep turning around. Um, the, um, this is actually how I organize, and I'm, uh, at, during the talk, I'm probably going to skip some things because I know that we, we want time for questions and I may not have enough time to go through it all. Um, but the, the, these are the questions that I'm asking, and I'll tell you what I know about answers to them, but there's definitely room for more uh, input. Um, so the first one is how does taxation affect innovation? You know, what are the channels? Um, why do we do this? Why do we think maybe we should have special um, tax incentives for innovative activities? How should we design um, these incentives? Uh, what, what do we think about patent boxes? Um, I'll give you my take on that, which is a, um, a tax, um, a relatively new uh, instrument that's being used very widely in Europe, um, which is essentially reduced taxes on patent income. Um, and so I'll talk about that. Uh, and then there are these harder questions. Um, do countries provide enough resources? Um, you all know that you know, the Lisbon Agenda set a 3% target uh, for Europe, 3% uh, of uh, GDP to be spent on R&D um, by government and business. Uh, is that a good number? Uh, you know, um, it sounded nice. Um, it was sort of benchmarked against uh, Korea and the U.S. and Japan. I think that's where it came from. Uh, but, um, but is it too much or too little? We don't know. 
And this coordination issue, um, which is definitely an issue. Uh, uh, okay, so um, my, my finger's too, too fast. There's, there's two broad topics when you talk about taxation for innovation. And I'm not going to talk about the first one. Okay, but it's there, and I can tell you that a lot of research is being done on it now, not by me, but by people at um, Harvard and Chicago and so forth. Um, recent paper by Axigate, uh, which is about this, um, uh, the impact of overall the tax system on innovation. Okay, so they're, they're looking across the U.S. and saying, do we have more innovation in states with lower taxes once we control for the other characteristics of the state? Obviously, the state I live in, okay, which is California, has lots of innovation and high taxes. Okay? So the simple thing is that the richer states also have higher taxes. It's also true of New York um, and Texas. <laughs> but um, Texas probably has lower taxes. But once you control for the other characteristics of the state, they do find that um, there is an incentive effect in the sense that there does tend to be more innovation um, in places with lower taxes. Um, I'm going to talk more about the direct uh, tar uh, tax uh, instruments, which are the things that are directed solely to innovative activity and not to other, um, other activities. Uh, so that's, you know, I've narrowed the topic even more. Um, so, uh, why do we do it? Uh, some of you will be familiar with these arguments, I'm sure. Uh, the basic argument is, and of course, um, I'm sure uh, this is one with which Schumpeter would have had some sympathy. The basic argument is that when firms do something or innovate or learn to do something uh, new, um, it benefits other firms in the sector, even though they may, a firm with a good innovation may protect it with intellectual property, it may um, try other methods of trying to keep the returns to itself. It's still the case that the knowledge will leak out and other um, other firms will take advantage of that knowledge and they'll probably build something better on top of it. Um, in other words, they'll, they'll innovate based on somebody else's innovation. And um, they'll innovate something new based on an innovation that's prior. So the idea is that we might want to encourage this activity because the price system, um, the rewards, may not be enough um, uh, to, to encourage enough of it. Uh, and some of these, some of these activities um, some of these spillovers, we call, the economists call them spillovers, you know, spillovers of knowledge. Some of them tend to be local um, to an economy or to a region, and that means you want, you actually want to encourage the activity in your region. You don't want to just assume that you'll benefit from what's going on in other regions. You're going to need, you're going to want to have something going on in your region. Um, there are other issues. Uh, this, uh, my one of my professors at Stanford, no, unfortunately no longer with us, but he was an active researcher up until the age of 94, uh, namely Kenneth Arrow, um, identified these very clearly in an article in 1962, which is that we won't necessarily get enough innovation because of this imitation factor, uh, because there's a lot of risk and uncertainty associated with it, and it's not something you can diversify and get rid of. You know, you undertake a whole bunch of different um, activities, you can't diversify enough to get rid of the risk in innovation. Um, there's a high cost of financing typically, partly because of these other reasons, um, and it's especially true for SMEs. Um, and then we have another aspect, which is one I'm not talking about much today, but it is a reason why governments spend money on this activity, which is the provision of public goods, um, such as health improvements, environmental improvements, defense, um, and so forth. We might do research, we might pay for, governments might pay for research to, for those things because they are, they are clearly seen as beneficial to the whole economy and not necessarily something that will be supplied by the marketplace in large enough quantities. Um, some of it will be, obviously. Now, um, <laughs> there's always this question, you know, I, I switch between R&D and innovation and that's, they're not the same thing, obviously. Um, for a long time, economists studied R&D and patents um, by the way, people who have, um, I, I don't object to taking photos of slides, I think it's perfectly good, but I do want to say that you don't have to because I tend to put everything on my website. Um, uh, so, so it's available. 
<laughs> uh, if, you, if you want it. And there's probably, a, a, not this talk, but uh, talks that are similar um, already out there. Um, so uh, so the, in, the things that firms do with respect to innovation that we can identify, that they spend money on, okay, which is the th when you're designing tax policy, you're basically designing something that, you know, is going to be denominated in monies, in euros. I mean, it's going to be um, related to spending that firms do and not necessarily to encouraging some guy to have a bright idea in the middle of the night. You, there's not, not much you can do about that. Um, the, um, the, the most important that we've dealt with in the past is obviously, and we've, we've spent a lot of attention on, is R&D spending directly. But there are other things that people do, and I want to highlight one, which is the purchase, installation, and use of new technologically advanced equipment and software. Okay, um, That turns out to be, if you survey firms, that's actually the biggest expenditure. Um, it's slightly bigger than R&D as a share of spending. And of course, it's very important. In the service sector especially, that's where the innovation is typically. Um, it's not so much that they're doing lots of R&D, it's that they're spending a lot to redesign their system, to, to reorganize the firm, reorganize how they do things. I always go back, because I'm so old, I always go back to what happened to the airline industry when they networked. Um, I mean, because I have this memory of standing in a line at a, you know, checking into a plane with a piece of paper with little stickers on it, each of which is a seat, and having that sticker peeled off and stuck on my ticket. Half the people in this room will never have done that. Uh, at least half the people in this room. But it was a big change when, the, when they went to the computer and were able to do this electronically. Um, you know, they had to reorganize the, the entire airline, uh, air, um, air travel sector. Um, then there's some other things like training of employees, marketing, and so forth. Um, the spillovers are obviously, you know, going to vary a lot, and the most important ones are going to come from the R&D. A lot of the other stuff is stuff that's just a cost that the firm bears, and you may want to encourage training, for example, um, if you think that the employees are not um, getting the full benefit of it in their wages, um, or if you think the firm won't spend enough because the employees will leave um, and do it somewhere, you know, works for someone else, um, that's something that you may want to think about. Um, so, the list of remedies for the, the undersupplying of uh, innovation that economists come up with are, um, the first one is property rights. Um, this is the patent system, really, although it could be copyrights and you know, other things, trademarks, but patent system is probably the most important. And the problem with the patent system, of course, is that um, you essentially handle a temporary, you hand a temporary monopoly to the holder of the patent. It's, it's much more complicated than that, but that, you know, at a simple theoretical level, that's what you're doing. Um, one of the reasons it's more complicated is because it, there'll be multiple patents, you know, so it's really just a bunch of patents, um, which is creating the temporary monopoly. Um, and when firms have a temporary monopoly, they tend to undersupply, uh, they tend to charge higher prices and undersupply the, the from the consumer welfare perspective, they tend to undersupply the good. The other problem is you can't play around with the patent system as much as you used to be able to um, because of TRIPS, because you basically, most of the countries in the world have signed on to um, a, a minimal set of standards for the patent system. Um, that's not necessarily a great idea from the perspective of development. Um, if from Europe itself, it's probably not a big deal, um, but from when, from the, perspective of developing countries having one size fits all in the patent system, not really terribly good because the imitation strategy is a good one for developing countries and has been used in the past by countries like Taiwan, um, Korea, the US in the 19th century, and so forth. Um, okay, then there's subsidies, um, and then, you know, of which there are many such programs. Um, and some of you have probably, there may be people in the room who've applied for such an R&D subsidy and actually used it. I wouldn't be surprised to hear there are several people who've done that. Uh, and then there are tax credits of various kinds. And finally, there's the direct government uh, spending. Now, the contrast between subsidies and tax credits, it's a little bit of a false contrast, but there is a contrast. Um, Subsidies have quite high administrative costs because of the fact that you have to choose, the government in principle has to choose the projects. Sometimes in some countries they just hand out the money if you, you know, apply for it. 
But most places have targeted subsidies that they're, they're for some particular thing and they tend to, that means you have to have somebody in the government who can review the proposals and so forth and so on and that gets to be expensive. Tax credits are, are useful because they let the firm choose the projects that are useful. Now that has upsides and downsides. Firms choose stuff that's private, privately profitable. Um, it may also have social benefits but it's privately profitable. Um, uh, and there are some audit costs, um, and tax, agent, tax authorities get a little uh, upset about auditing R&D um, costs because they don't understand R&D, basically. Um, it's not their business, that's not what they do. Uh, and and it, uh, this has certainly been a U.S. experience, but those costs do tend to be lower than the subsidy costs. Um, so. Um, Corporate tax and innovation. Um, R&D tax credit now widely used. I'll, I'll show you later um, where it's used. Um, there is one thing I wanted to highlight, which is the investment tax credit. It's not something I'm talking about, but it is something which is very useful for encouraging uh, firms to adopt new technologies. Um, so, because you know, if you if you reduce if you allow people to accelerate the depreciation on equipment, which in the US, for example, I know that um, very small firms basically can expense all their investment. And I can't remember what the current situation is with respect to large firms. There have been a lot of proposals to allow full expensing of equipment, um, but I don't think it's happened yet. Um, uh, but certainly small firms uh, can expense all their equipment and that encourages them to buy new equipment. Of course, at this point, given the rate of change in IT, um, you know, the, the lifetime isn't that long anyway. You know, I mean, it's two years or something for these, you know, small, small computers. Um, or now it's the telephones, you know, they only last for two years. Um, the, um, and then there are these IP boxes, which are what I refer to as a patent box, because I call it a patent box because that's what I study and that's what I'm going to talk about. But they can cover other things like copyrights, trademarks, which strike me as you know, much more difficult to evaluate income from. Copyright, no, I mean, you can do that. And if you're in the film industry or something, you know, it's a music industry, then it makes a lot of sense. Trademarks, I'm not so sure how you assign value to those um, for the tax purpose. Um, and finally, there's this non, um, uh, and, and this depends on your tax system, and there is a lot of variability here. There's this uh, sort of non, um, non-subsidy instrument, which is typically R&D spending and some innovative spending is not, I mean, not, not the equipment spending, but just R&D spending is not very well financed by debt because it doesn't create a securable asset. There's some, some evidence out there that we're, we're trying to get patent markets going, but they're not really very big at this point, and a lot of stuff is unsold. Um, patent markets would be one way to create a securable asset um, for your innovation. Your firm goes out of business, you own some patents, can you sell them on the open market? Okay, well typically you have to sell them at a pretty big discount and if your firm went out of business it may mean that the technology in those patents isn't very useful anyway. So there's some problems with that. But given, given this non-secured uh, asset you're creating with, um, with R&D, uh, which is to say a lot of intangible capital, knowledge, you know, of how to do things, um, employees that are smarter than they used to be, et cetera. Um, equity turns out to be a better form of finance and that means that if you're using a tax system which allows um, interest expense to be deductible but not a dividend expense, there is a, a bias in favor of non-innovative non spending. There's a discrimination against innovative spending. So that can be a factor. Um, so now, now think about, suppose you decide that you want to encourage um, innovative activity uh, in the private sector. Um, how do you design instruments? Well, I wanted to um, highlight a few things that are uh, things to think about, uh, which <laughs> the current instruments, some of them not so good at, at this. Um, first of all, uh, it's sort of obvious, but it's, it's important that the instrument be visible to the firm decision makers, um, which is to say really teeny things or things that'll happen way in the future or whatever are not gonna be visible. 
Um, and that is actually an issue with the R&D tax credit. It was at first um, in some countries that they just, you know, they didn't, they didn't use it because it didn't seem to be of any interest. Um, it wasn't, particularly for smaller firms, it wasn't well publicized, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an interesting thing to them. Um, does the time horizon of benefits m match that of the investment? Um, that's, that's actually, that's actually two, that covers two things. One is, um, you're undertaking something which may not pay off right away. It doesn't, in some cases it will, but in other cases it doesn't. I mean, in the drug industry, for example, it doesn't. Um, uh, it takes you quite a while to bring something to the market. Um, in certain types of, say, an app for the phone, it may pay off rather quickly. Um, so, so the question is, what do you do about the fact that um, uh, they may not have profits in the short term, and they may have a lot of costs in the short term, um, and they may have losses? Uh, and so you have to think about ways to, um, ways to ensure that they actually receive the credit. Uh, if it's one of those things they can only receive five years from now when they have profits, you know, they can go under before then. It's not going to look like a big incentive to them. Um, then there's this uh, stability issue. This has been a big issue in the US, okay? And I don't, it's less of an issue in Europe so far, but still, there's this issue about redesigning the instrument, particularly for R&D every year. Not a good idea. People plan R&D in larger firms, typically, or even for certain types of projects in smaller firms. They plan over a horizon, which is, can be several years. If they can't count on the benefit of the tax credit looking forward, they're going to just ignore it. They're going to say, you know, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know if I'm going to have it next year, so I'll pretend like I don't, okay? Or I'll count, put some probability on it or something. Um, and that was a big issue in the U.S. because for a long time our R&D tax credit was temporary. Um, and it was, you know, sort of went back to Congress every couple of years and then it kept changing the rules and so forth. And this affects decision making, uh, decisions, um, there's a targeting issue. Um, like I said, with a tax credit, the firm is choosing the projects. It may choose the ones that it's privately profitable um, and not the ones that you would actually, um, that actually have the biggest social benefits. Uh, that's the advantage of the subsidy program. You can target towards things that might have more social benefits. Um, so, so the solution to this, and I, I mention it later, but I'll say it now because we can skip over it. Um, the many, many of these credits actually do go directly towards cooperative, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, cooperative R&D between universities and companies or public research organizations and companies, you know, special deals for that. Um, and that's really getting at this, targeting the spillover um, idea. Um, and finally, is it comparatively easy to audit? Um, this means don't, even though, even though a good one might be rather complex, you might want to avoid that because it'll create a real um, audit cost. For example, my colleagues who, who uh, are looking into the um, general corporate tax problem also looked at the design of R&D tax credits, and the optimal design is actually rather complex. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is there's going to be a big audit uh, issue, plus, the other thing that comes up quite often here is um, mergers and acquisitions and um, uh, f uh, industry structure, uh, which is to say when you go through mergers and acquisitions, if you have a complex instrument that has different rates for different companies, you create all these incentives to, do, to play games with the structure of companies and you really don't want to, you don't want to be in that game. Um, okay, so um, two things. Uh, just summarizing, you know, what the, the two instruments I'm really focused on. Um, uh, and just point out that the IP box can cover stuff that R&D doesn't cover, but, um, uh, which is an advantage, um, but uh, there's some other disadvantages. Um, okay, so who has them? Well, it turns out almost all um, OECD countries now. Um, 30 out of 35, also Brazil, China, and Russia. Uh, and they've been increasing in generosity um, over the last couple of decades. 6% um, subsidy to 17%, you know, 4% to 14% and so forth. Let's not, you know, dwell on it because we don't really have time. Um, so there's a map. Um, 
it's the developed world plus large countries in the developing world. Um, there are two different types. Um, one is pure tax relief for R&D, and the other one is a subsidy for the social charges of R&D employees, um, which I haven't talked about, but that is actually one of the best types of instruments, um, and I'll talk, say a few things on it later. Uh, patent boxes are, although there's, there, I think there's one in, um, trying, to, trying to look, yeah, Japan, there's one in Japan. Uh, it's basically a European thing. Um, and this is tax competition, okay? That's, what, that's why it's a European thing. Um, the, the patent box is a funny thing. I, you know, I, 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 I think it's a terrible idea for encouraging innovation, okay? And I'll tell you all the reasons. But when you stop and think about it, you realize how it happened, besides the fact that some large firms lobbied for it. Um, because, of course, once you're successful, you have profits. That's when you want your tax, um, taxes reduced. Um, and, of course, that's what patents are associated with, profits, um, particularly in the drug sector. This is particularly a drug sector phenomenon. Um, the, but when you think about it from a policymaker perspective, uh, one of the reasons why it happened is because uh, the income from intangibles is highly mobile. And so you might think that not because you wanted to encourage innovation, but just because you wanted to keep it in your country, you might introduce a patent box. Okay, that, and that is, that is really what happened here. I mean, why there's been a, a wave of these, um, of these instruments. A patent box typically has, I'll show you the tax rates, but it typically gives you a tax rate that's you know, about 20 or 30% um, less than uh, absolute 20 or 30. You know, corporate tax a certain level and then you drop at 20, 20 percent percentage points or something on your income from patents if you can identify it. Um, okay. Uh, now, the other thing I wanted to show you, I don't expect you to take away this, uh, anything, you know, details here, but uh, this is OECD numbers, um, and it's, it's basically the composition of government funding for R&D, and um, the solid, I mean, sorry, the darker, the darker red and blue are the tax incentive funding for R&D, and the lighter is the direct government funding. The main thing to see in this graph is it varies a lot. Every country has its own idea of how to, you know, how much to do and how to break it up. Um, this is as percents of the, um, of GDP, okay? So that big number is Russia. Russia does a lot of direct government funding of R&D uh, compared to everybody else. Well, of course, the reason for that is that is the defense sector, but also um, labs, I think, um, uh, uh, science labs, uh, all come under that. Whereas with the USA, I think we're not counting a lot of stuff that's going on at universities in this number, um, is my impression, um, given the way the numbers are collected. So the, the structure of the economy does affect how these, how these numbers look. Um, that's one of the things that you learn. But the other thing you learn by looking at it is that I put the G7 in red, even across the G7, there's high variability, okay? And you will notice one, two, three, four, five, six. There are only six there. That's because Germany is here, right? Germany doesn't have an R&D tax credit. It didn't have an R&D tax credit. I think, you know, my, my colleague um, at MPI, Dietmar Harhoff, is the head of the Innovation Council for Merkel, and he's basically been arguing in favor of one, you know, for the last five years, and I think they may get one, but uh, at this point, but they don't. They didn't have one when these numbers were collected. Um, so, um, uh, so this shows you again, you know, just the same thing, which is that all the way from Netherlands, which is almost all tax incentives, down to New Zealand, which you know is 10% tax incentives. It just shows you the variability. Um, so. Okay, so then there's the design question. Now let me look at my, well, we started a little late, but I think I should move on, because um, uh, this is, we shouldn't spend too much time on this. Just let me say that um, the alternative form, uh, the reduced social charges on SED employment for R&D, is uh, used in a few countries like the Netherlands and Belgium, and it's really, a, it's really a pretty good design, because it's very straightforward, the firm gets it by never giving any money to get, never giving the money to the government. 
okay? Because they just have, when they're paying for the, you know, the, the, whatever, the social security and all that, when they're paying that for the employees, they just pay a lower rate. Okay, and um, as a function of how much R&D employment they have. R&D expense is mostly employment, okay, so this makes sense. Um, it avoids all the carry forward problems. It's also, from an audit perspective, the main thing you have to do is identify the employees. Okay, other than that, it's pretty clear because you're paying them a salary, you know what the salary is. The, you know, the tax authority doesn't have to, you know, look around unless they really think you're slipping money under the table or something, but that would be an issue anyway, so. Uh, incremental credits are extremely hard to design, and I don't want to spend time on them because we don't have time. They are used by some countries. Um, incremental is, uh, means you're trying to give a reduced rate only on the amount that the firm increased its R&D spending. It's a great idea. It's imp almost impossible to design. Um, and I can say more about that, but I just... Um, and then, this is more interesting to the audience, okay, is that there, there are a number of countries who, who, do, um, who provide higher subsidies to small and medium-sized firms um, and of different types. Uh, incremental payroll-based, startups or young firms. Um, the differences can vary um, quite a bit. Um, but I can tell you also that these differences vary over years, E2, as well as, as, well as across countries, so it's hard to get a, a clear picture. And they keep changing. Um, uh, this 2018 paper that I cite is one that is, has the most recent numbers, and they're up to 2017. Um, but it's changing as we speak. Okay, uh, okay it works. Um, Here's a summary, which, so then I don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, the question you always ask yourself is, you know, is it effective? And at this point, there's been ton, there have been a ton of studies of does it increase business R&D um, in, in many countries? And the answer is always, um, almost always yes. And even the recent ones, more carefully done ones, the answer is yes. The usual answers cluster around the notion that if you reduce the cost of doing R&D by 10%, you will get 10% more R&D. It's one for one, okay? So it's costing you, as a tax authority, pretty much how, what's coming out in, in terms of R&D. The central thing, which I said, but the misinterpretation, okay? Do private rates of return fall? Theoretically, if you subsidize a firm to do more R&D, it should choose projects that it wouldn't have done if it hadn't had the subsidy. That means that the return should be lower than the return without the subsidy, okay? So an evaluation that comes and says, wow, we're getting really high returns for this subsidy, this is a, this, this is a statement that you didn't need to subsidize, okay? Um, and and so, so it's important to sort of understand that point because you do see it misinterpreted often. Um, Unfortunately, the thing you really wanted was to encourage an increase in, in um, knowledge exchange with other firms. That's been not studied very much at all. And, uh, and, and that's because it's difficult to study. I mean, there is a reason, but um, anyway. Okay, so evidence, there's lots of it and there's new stuff and I'm not gonna do it. Um, there is a new paper on this spillover benefits, but uh, I, it's fairly tenuous. Um, uh, results. I include it because, uh, partly because colleagues at um, uh, Balsmeyer is European, but the co-authors are at Berkeley. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it's still, I would say, fairly, um, you know, uh, looking uh, mainly at California R&D. We have a tax credit in addition to the federal tax credit. The state of California has a fairly generous one too. Um, okay, now patent boxes. I really should, this slide I should talk about. Um, why do I think they're a bad idea? Well, they're a bad idea for spurring innovation. Okay, they may be a good idea in the sense that, you know, you got tired of your income going off to Ireland to be taxed at 10%. Uh, the, why, why do I prefer R&D tax credits for encouraging innovation? Well, first of all, it's related, it's directly related to the firm decision, okay? Not to its luck or failure in getting a new innovation, but to its decision to spend money on getting a new innovation. Um, so that seems like a good idea. Um, it doesn't create incentives to transfer patents to low-tax jurisdictions. 
we have some evidence that they, firms do indeed transfer patents in response to the patent box, but it's not a big effect. They do transfer them. You don't subsidize the guys who are trolling. Okay, um, so, so if your business is buying other people's patents and trying to enforce them against, um, against small firms, uh, possibly, who don't have deep pockets um, and can't fight you, and, you know, it could be a bad patent, um, or um, if that's your business model, your entire profit is patent related. Okay, you've basically subsidized that activity. Um, there's no incentive to keep a zombie patent, one that should be overturned, okay, or should be not be renewed, alive in order to um, reduce taxes. Um, patent boxes target the most appropriate part of innovation. It's the part that you didn't need to subsidize because you could get returned to it, um, because you had, were able to keep other people from imitating you precisely. Um, and there's a much higher audit cost. I mean, uh, when I start thinking about, you know, the notion, and in fact, when the zombie patent uh, idea, you start thinking about this notion that does the tax authority have to determine patent validity? You know, I mean, this is really bad. Uh, you know, the patent office has enough trouble doing it. You know, you don't really want the tax authorities doing it. Um, so uh, there's a higher audit cost. The box design, as a result, tends to vary a lot across countries. Some countries use gross income because they don't want to deal with the problem of allocating cost to profit so they can reduce income on profit. Um, and, uh, but that's kind of nuts because it gives you crazy incentives. Um, you have this incentive to choose pro projects depending on the box design, sometimes with high um, non-R&E expenses if you get to put all your expense over there. So it's, uh, it, it varies so much across country that I can't give specific examples. Um, there's a, there's a lot of variation in the rule. I think I should mention um, CFC rules um, uh, just because that's an, that was an issue in Europe. CFC rules are, are one of the ways in which companies try to prevent this business of moving, um, of paper movement of income to low tax jurisdictions. It's controlled foreign corporation. That's what it stands for. Um, and uh, within Europe, you're actually not allowed to impose CFC rules on other countries within Europe, according to the European Court of Justice. So net result is that it doesn't really um, apply within EEA, actually. Um, but that's one, I mean, that's one way that countries try to prevent the transfer of income to the Cayman Islands and places like that. Um, uh, and that, mean, that would also affect this instrument. You know, if you transferred your patents to the Cayman Islands so you could get profits on your uh, patents from the Cayman Islands, um, uh, that's the CFC rules might prevent you from uh, that activity. They wouldn't prevent you, they would just tax that income at the domestic rate, so it wouldn't be of any benefit. Um, okay, uh, so let's, I'm going to go to the summary on this. Let me just show you that there is indeed variation. Within, Europe, within the, the countries that we studied, which is basically Europe plus a bunch of developed countries, um, in the rest of the world, you know, the usual ones, Japan, Korea, US, that sort of thing. Um, the corporate tax rate varies from 10% to uh, 40% or even 50% or for one year in one country. Uh, and um, the, w the difference between the corporate tax and the patent box tax rate varied from 5% all the way up to 35%, okay? So you could be taxed, you, you know, if your tax rate was 40% on corporate tax income, your patent box rate might be 5%. So it's a big number in some cases. In other cases, it's a much smaller number. Um, and, um, well, that just shows you that when the patent box got introduced in Europe, there were some transfers, but there were also some transfers before uh, anticipation um, in the UK, I think. Um, the main message here is that the OECD, um, has a, a project with the Commission on uh, the base erosion profit shifting or whatever, which is all about standardizing tax rules um, uh, somewhat, not completely obviously, because that really takes a lot of negotiation. Uh, and that, that, the standards in BEPS actually um, limit the use of existing and patents that are acquired um, that aren't further developed in a patent income uh, in a patent, use, use of them in reducing your patent, your tax, your tax um, on your patent income. 
And that seems to be effective, which is to say that we found that where that existed, you people did not transfer patents just to get the tax uh, benefits, which is what you'd expect. So, you know, fine. Um, what's important here, this is actually the important finding. Um, we tried to look at whether when you introduced a patent box, did the inventors in your country start patenting more? Okay, which is what you might have thought. If it's supposed to encourage innovation in the country, then you would think that when you introduce a patent box and you make the income on, um, on the income derived from patents um, more um, taxed at a lower rate, you would think that would encourage patented invention in the country. And the answer is we just can't see anything. If anything, it's negative. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't really believe the negative, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's just not there. Um, we, we find actually the same thing for R&D. Um, you can't see the R&D in the country increase either. Um, so that just means it's not being very effective for that purpose. It may be effective in get, getting people to move patent income around, but it's not effective in that purpose. You don't want to see that. That's boring. Um, okay, because we, you know, let's, let's move along. So um, uh, the only thing that's new here um, is the thing at the bottom. Um, we, did, we did in our research find that, that as you'd expect, that more valuable p patents were, like, were more likely to be transferred because they were the ones generating the income. Um, so that's not too surprising. Okay, so let's go to um, a couple of things, you know, at the end of my um, presentation. Um, do countries provide enough support for, R support for R&D? Um, probably not. Um, is the, the R&D economist's answer. Um, but uh, that's based on the fact that when we try to measure the returns to research and development at the country level, we tend to find very high numbers. This is very hard to do, and I'm not totally convinced that the social returns are really that high. But economists keep finding high social returns. Uh, and by social returns, we mean the returns to the economy as a whole. Okay, that's what we mean. That's a very hard thing to measure. And um, what we do have some nuance, which is interesting. Uh, first of all, domestic spillovers within the country do seem to matter more. Now, that's, that's actually, um, uh, they're larger, I should say. Um, that's actually a statement that you can't just borrow from everybody else. You have to do some stuff yourself for absorptive capacity. Um, uh, they're more important, the spillovers are more important for smaller open economies. No, that doesn't surprise us either. Um, and um, there's one piece of evidence, one paper that tried to figure out whether we're doing the right amount in the U.S., okay? And they argue that it's two to four times the actual amount we're doing. I'm not, I'm not going to say that's what I believe, okay? Um, uh, but, you know. The macroeconomists have ways of doing this. I just don't necessarily believe it all. Uh, you know, it's, it's suggestive. Um, the international coordination issue. Okay, that's another issue that it's really worth um, exploring um, in more detail. Uh, the, all the evidence we have says that, yes, countries, firms in countries that don't have a tax credit pay attention to what's going on in other countries, or vice versa. If you have a tax credit, you're still paying attention to the level in other countries of the R&D tax credit. So this is Bloom and Griffith um, uh, basically finding out that domestic R&D responds to the foreign cost of R&D, okay? um, which is to say if the foreign cost is lower, of a weighted average of all the other countries they could move it to, and it's, typically it's done with about 10 countries, okay? the ones that do a lot of R&D, uh, large ones that do a lot of R&D. Um, if that, if that weighted average falls, then your domestic R&D falls. Well, the assumption is that you've moved it over there because it's cheaper. Um, you know, they've given a tax break to it. Um, no, it's oh, eight large OECD economies. Uh, Corrado et al. did it for 10 in a more recent period, find the same thing. Um, Wilson uh, did it with US states. Okay, so there you have 50 states. Well, of course, in the U.S., I mean, and this is, a, this is relevant for Europe, obviously, because Europe's somewhere in between these two things. Um, the U.S., it's obviously the case that it's a lot easier to move. It's not easy, because you've got to move employees that are highly paid who will not like the idea 
of moving from California to Wyoming, okay? It doesn't appeal. Um, you know, so you're going to lose people <laughs> when you do that. So you're, you know, there, there's, but what typically happens, most firms, when they want to move their R&D, and internationally this is very true, they open a new lab. It's not that they move an old lab. It's, they do it when they're growing their R&D, and then they open a new lab in a different place. That's the typical pattern. Um, so uh, anyway, I think it's worth, uh, so, so there are some questions, um, my questions, you know. And so these are my answers um, to finish up, uh, which is um, how does taxation affect innovation? Well, I say mostly negatively, what I mean is higher taxes reduce innovation, okay? Um, or lower tax on innovative activity increases innovation. Um, why are there special tax incentives? Well, I mentioned externalities, financing constraints. Uh, how should R&D tax credits be designed? I didn't uh, go into this in detail, but the answer is carefully. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I couldn't give you all the answers you know, on one slide. Uh, so then you get some you know, clearer answers. Um, uh, are patent boxes a good way to spur innovation? No, I think that comes through. Um, do countries provide enough resources to support private R&D? I say probably not. Um, uh, I do think that we don't really know, but I, I think that, you know, on the whole, the evidence is that probably not. And should there be coordination across countries? And I think on the tax side, yeah, there probably should be. Um, the, the temptations for tax competition are just too great. Um, you know, it's, it's, it really, which... You know, and, and it's, it's something I say often, which is that, you know, from an SME's perspective, maybe this isn't a big deal. Um, you know, because most SMEs, may, they may sell worldwide, but they typically are located in one place. But the tax authorities are also dealing with these multinationals, and the multinationals are in many places. And, you know, this, the same applies to antitrust. It's very hard to run antitrust policy and it's very hard to run tax policy um, that is targeted at multinationals because they always have the option of, you know, being somewhere else. Um, and, uh, and so you, a certain amount of coordination is needed, uh, I think. Many thanks. Very inspiring, Professor Hall. <laughs> uh, I think we have a bit of time for questions. You made the point that countries do not do enough to support R&D. However, patent boxes are not a good tool. What are some programs that would be beneficial? Oh, OK. Um, the, um, well, first of all, there's the R&D tax credit, which I did suggest. Um, and I think uh, some, of them, some of them could be a bit you know, more generous. OK, not all. I mean, some of them are quite generous. The French, for example, have been just pouring money into it. Um, the, I mean, they, they improve it every year, you know. Um, the, um, I, I believe in a mix of policies, so I think the R&D subsidy um, route is also a good route, uh, partly, you know, partly because I think there are some things where you're better off um, saying you really want this, you want this pro project done. Um, some of my colleagues would advocate prizes for long-met needs. I mean, sorry, long unmet needs, uh, which is to say where pri a prizes, of, it, prizes for innovative activity are actually good. Uh, the problem is in ma many of our most important innovations would not have been achieved with a prize because we had no idea we were going to want them. Okay, the laser was one. I mean, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Internet. I mean, we just, you know, it's, it's not. But on the other hand, malaria vaccines, you know, uh, batteries are clearly an issue. Um, uh, you know, they, right now, if they make them any bigger, they're going to go, you know, the car's going to go out in flames, you know, kind of. We need some, some way to give them greater life, et cetera. So prizes will work for some things like that, and they do it for the uh, robot, you know, robot, um, you know, cars driving around in the desert. Uh, although this seems to be enough return out there, so plenty of people are willing to undertake R&D in it. Um, uh, it, the other thing, I guess the other side of this is, I mean, I don't, I don't talk about this so much in Europe because Europe already, you know, has good education system, et cetera. But for developing countries, that's clearly the issue, okay? You, you need, you basically need human capital. I mean, that's the most important in, 
input to innovation. So, so, that, so it's really uh, having enough education at, at, the, at the secondary level as well as at the, uh, as well as at the tertiary uh, level um, and putting money into that. Um. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, can I just take you back to an, at an early stage? You were talking about the um, government support for basic research and indeed mm -hmm. for research in the private sector. Now, of course, I come from Cambridge and um, <laughs> in the United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, and uh, what we see is both cluster effects mm -hmm. and a very big spillover effect from government support for universities and mm -hmm. um, uh, basic research. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you see as the relative merits of government supporting basic research and looking for those social returns rather than necessarily supporting private R&D? Okay, well, I didn't, it didn't talk about that, but um, I'm, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, I'm in the sector. I mean, I believe in it. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's just, it, academics don't have any problem telling you we should support basic research um, in various ways. I mean, um, mostly, via, um, mostly via university research, but um, it's obviously been a very successful model. Uh, the biggest problem with the basic research support, I mean, the thing, we don't have any, amb there's no ambiguity in my mind that, you know, most of the stuff ultimately does derive from basic research, but it takes a lot of money to get it to be something useful, um, you know, in various ways. The biggest problem is you can't predict which... When, it's gonna, when the stuff is going to be useful. I mean, you know, a lot of mathematical invention or whatever, mathematical research from the 19th century or even you go back, is being used in the cryptography area now and the internet, okay? My favorite example of why we have to support every field rather than choose fields is the, um, the <laughs> Cambridge again, uh, the bio revolution, I mean the, um, the DNA revolution. Because before that, it, you know, biology was a wet science. Uh, the people who went into it were the people who couldn't do math. Basically, that was the idea. You, if you wanted to be a scientist, you went to biology if you didn't like math. Otherwise, you did chemistry or physics, uh, you know, back in the day. And then suddenly, we needed all these computer scientists because of the DNA revolution. And so, so we needed to have people, you know, available for that field even if we hadn't, we didn't know that ahead of time, that, that suddenly we needed to have bioscientists around, biostatisticians, bioscientists, you know, computer science. Um, the, um, so, the, so the more complex answer, because people ask this too, is how do you balance out your research portfolio? That's a really hard thing to do. And you can't do it by looking at the past. This is the problem. You don't know um, what you're gonna need in the future. Um, I always say it's like the, the, gu you know, the guys in the stock market, uh, uh, investment, you know, the investment brochure, which at the bottom says, you know, past results are not an indication of future performance, and that's the problem with research. It's the same way. Um, <laughs> so even though we would like to measure the returns to basic research that was done in, you know, the 1940s in the U.S., we know they're large. Um, you know, what we were doing in defense in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s has had big payoffs in the private sector, in the 70s, the 80s, the, you know. But measuring that is extremely difficult because it's long and variable lags, basically. Mm. Uh, hello, uh, Chris Haley from Nesta. In, in the UK, um, half of all business expenditure on R&D is, is inward bird. Um, if the UK is to reach its 2.4% target, there's an argument to say that actually we should be trying very hard to increase the, the, the inflow of R&D into the UK, and yet you you cited one paper which suggested that the spillovers from international R&D were arguably less than mm -hmm. domestic yeah. R&D. But if it's, when you say inward bird, do you mean it's bird done in the UK by foreign firms? So, it, 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 so yes. Uh, oh, or, well, or, that's or, local. <laughs> that's well, local. Okay. <laughs> and, and, but yeah, part, yeah. partly also by, by firms that are ultimately subsidiaries of overseas firms as well. Oh, right? yeah. So, no, no. But, but, but done, done locally. Yeah, but that's Did local. You, Okay. Yeah, I so mean, that's, that's, that's a domestic spillover okay. uh, that comes from there, so uh, you, not, a, not you, an international. You, 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 do you have any concerns that the spillovers are less because of the, where the parent company is situated? Well, the one, the one I know about, of course, is one that was a UK company and got bought by 
Um, and I, you know, got bought by, the one I know the most about is Glaxo's. Glaxo, Smith Kind, Welcome, blah, 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 you know. I mean, I, back, I, mean, I, I own stock back when it was Beckman Instruments or something, you know. I mean, they, they did so many acquisitions over the years. And ultimately, um, ultimately, yeah, they're headquartered in the UK now. But they have an enormous lab in, in outside Philadelphia, I think. Um, and I, I, I don't know, you know, the, the specifics um, in general. I mean, I don't know in general whether spillovers are weakened at all by it being foreign firms doing it. Um, I do know, I, well, actually, I do have one answer to that. In, in Europe, okay, especially in Western Europe, I think it's a non-issue, okay? Because it's the local, pe the local firm is employing local people. They went to local universities. Yes, people migrate across countries and so forth. Where this becomes an issue is in places like Costa Rica, for example, had an Intel plant. And the history on that was they didn't, seem too many, they didn't see too many spillovers. Um, it comes down to the absorptive capacity of the locals. I mean, that, that's a term of art. Okay, economists call the ability to, under, to learn from other researchers or from other people doing things um, in industry, we call it absorptive capacity, okay? That basically says you've got an educated workforce. A, you know, in this case, a fairly highly educated workforce um, that can um, learn stuff. Um. Okay, last question here, and then we have to go. Richard Sturm, Graz Schumpeter Center. I very much endorsed your critical stance vis-a-vis -vis the patent boxes. <laughs> Indeed, you very nicely presented and explained some fairly standard microeconomic uh, arguments showing that they are not a good, such a good <laughs> idea combined with uh, some insights um, uh, about the working of the patent system, which also suggests that they are not a really good idea. So my problem is, why are they nonetheless so popular in Europe? Uh, the, the arguments are fairly obvious in my mm. view yeah. and yeah. Uh, the forces which you mentioned are also uh, uh, predictable that there will be some lobbying and that there will be some pressure in terms of tax, competi uh, in in terms of, uh, uh, tax competition. So one would expect uh, uh, the EU to combat those tendencies if mm -hmm. innovation policy is so important mm -hmm. and tax uh, patent boxes are such a bad instrument, <laughs> which, which they obviously are, I fully agree with you. Uh, you want to yeah, it is, it is, I mean, some of it is lobbying. I, I know that that is a lot to do with the UK case. Um, some of it is because when you first say it to a, to a legislator who doesn't know a lot about you know, tax and, and, you know, just thinks innovation's a good thing. It sounds wonderful to him, you know? It's like, we'll give him a lower tax rate, so we'll do more of it here, you know? And so they sort of sign on without, you know, really realizing. If you talk to DG Tax, okay, they don't like it. Yeah, um, right? I mean, I mean that the, anybody who's thought about it, you know, and who actually knows about the tax system and so forth, doesn't like it. On the other hand, if you're a policymaker within a country that sees your R&D labs maybe moving to Luxembourg, well not Luxembourg, but the Netherlands because they have a patent box, um, you get, um, you notice that patent income is very mobile and you say, well, gee, I wanna keep it in my country um, and so I'll do this because it is mobile. I mean, I think it's related to this issue of, of you see it being mobile, you see it moving away and then you say, well, if it's moving away there, I better have one too. Um, and so it's, that is tax competition. I, I think that's it. But I honestly think the BEPS, BEPS is basically going to stop the patent transfer. It may not stop the patent box, though, um, which is, you know, and, and I, do, I do think it's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Professor Hall, I would really like to thank you. We have here... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> this is your talk. And oh, this wow. is a small present for you. This is your talk. Uh, but who did, who did this? <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. <laughs> oh, you did that? Yes. Oh, wow. It was an honor. Oh, thank you. That's, that's terrific. Can you see? I mean. It's a complex thing. Yeah.
Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and not only that, she managed to fill the paper without knowing when I was going to stop. I mean, I, <laughs> it's very impressive. <laughs> Minister Schreinberg, Professor Hall, ladies and gentlemen, as the steering minister for economics, tourism, science and research, I must say that I'm really glad that Graz was chosen as venue for the SME Assembly 2018. And I must say thank you, Professor Hall, for this really interesting lecture. I think that was the perfect kickoff for the next two days. Thank you very much. In Styria, we have a very strong focus on innovation with a research and development quota of more than 5%. We are one of the most innovative regions in the European Union. And one of our main reasons for this success is also part of the title of the SME Assembly, because this is connect and share. And connect and share is something we do in Styria for many years. We were, for example, the first region in Europe that created a cluster, the automotive cluster, more than 20 years ago, and we nowadays have several well-organized industry clusters in several fields, for example, in the green technology field, in health tech or microelectronics. Another field where we really connect and share are our numerous centers of excellence. In Austria, we have 30, 39 of these centers, and every second center is located here in Styria, with 19 out of 39 that are here in Styria. So you can see that we have a really good collaboration between our universities, our research institutions, and also our industry and the small and medium-sized enterprises here in Styria. And as innovation has been the heart of our economic strategy for many years, we were also awarded as European Enterprise Region in 2013. And so I really hope that Zero will be an inspiring location for this conference, for the SME Assembly in 2018. Before we now move upstairs to have dinner, I just would like to say a bit about this building. It's the Kunsthaus Graz. It's really a building with an outstanding architecture. And it now is one of our landmarks in Styria. It was designed by London architects. They were, it was designed by Peter Cook and Colin Fournier. And it was opened in 2003 when Graz was capital of culture. You can find exhibitions of contemporary art on the, uh, on the uh, floors above in the so-called bubble. And we all will now move to the so-called needle, which is a, a remarkable glass st uh, structure and where you have an unforgettable view of Graz, and so it is a really popular event location. And so finally, I think every one of us is waiting for this sentence. Finally, in the name of the Austrian presidency, the European Commission, and the regional government of Styria, I now have the pleasure to invite you to the dinner in our needle. Thank you very much. Thank you.